we're in this series about relationships. This is for people who are single, married, divorced, or it's complicated. And if you take notes, you can actually do a fill in the blanks on our app, the Life Michigan app. There's a fill in the notes section for today's message. Last week, the big idea was this, where men step into their calling, everything flourishes. And where men refuse to step into their calling, everything burns. And that's going to apply today as we talk about building better marriages. We're going to be in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 5. So get your hands on a Bible or a Bible app. If you've got the Life Michigan app, the Bible is right there on the app. But Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to zero in on a key scripture in Ephesians 5, because we live in a confusing culture. Things are being shouted at us on Netflix, from YouTubers, by politicians about what a normal, healthy relationship looks like. And the culture is increasingly breaking down men and then saying that the government will do what men have historically done. The government will protect you, provide for you, will set the morality for your family, will indoctrinate your children. And my argument is that we don't need more government, we need more men, godly men, who submit themselves before Christ Jesus. In fact, later after the message, you and I get to witness something spectacular. We have the baptism tank out today because we are going to witness some people going forward in their faith through baptism. And baptism is submitting yourself before the Lord. And that is so important if we're going to have healthier relationships. If we want to build a better marriage, it begins by submitting to Christ Jesus. So before we get into Ephesians 5, let me kind of set the stage from scripture and from history of why things are so dysfunctional in our relationships. It goes all the way back to the beginning, creation, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. In Genesis 1, Genesis 2, God creates humanity out of the dust of the earth. He breathes life into the man, into the woman. And at the end of Genesis 2, it says, this is why a man will leave his father and mother, be joined together with his wife to become one flesh. And so at the very beginning, God created marriage. It is a gift to us. It is a blessing. It is a good thing. It's the two becoming one. Then we hit Genesis 3. Genesis 3 is where the snake comes in, tempts the woman, tempts the man to take the fruit, and sin, sickness, and death enter the world. Here's what's interesting. Satan waits until there's a marriage to attack. So God creates marriage, man and woman, together forever, and Satan wants to disrupt, to create chaos in what God has blessed and said is very good. So it should not surprise you when you are dating someone or you are married to someone that there's going to be conflict. There's going to be butting of heads. Marriage is one sinner marrying another sinner, and that produces more sin. So that's what's happening in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, the introduction of sin, strife, and shame to our relationships. Now, to solve this problem, God did not form a committee. God did not form an idea. God formed a family. And from Genesis 3 onward, we have the family of Adam and Eve, a big, long family tree that eventually leads to Jesus who is the second Adam, who rescues, redeems, and repairs what was broken by the first Adam. We are part of a big family tree. God has joined man and wife together, and Satan 
shows up after the marriage, not before. So here's the big idea for today. If you want to know the entire message in a nutshell, write this down. Today's big idea is that you and your spouse or you and your loved one are not each other's enemies. But if you do have an enemy, and that enemy wants you to think that your spouse is the enemy. So we don't want to be fighting in our marriage. We want to be fighting for our marriage. Ephesians 5 is where we're going to get tips and tools for our relationships. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Ephesians chapter 5 is all about how to undo the damage done by Satan. So Ephesians 5, I'm, I'm going to like share a verse, then I'm going to talk and unpack it, and I'm going to share some more verses, talk and unpack it, share some verses, talk and unpack it. So that way you get an idea of what Ephesians 5 is. It's the first aid kit for marriages. Ephesians 5, 21 says this. We'll put it on the screen. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This verse. This is the culture in which a healthy, thriving marriage will always grow. Two people submitting to one another. Two people putting the interests of the other person ahead of their own. Because Christ followers are people who like Jesus. And we don't just like Jesus. Christ followers are people who want to become just like Jesus. And when we look at the life of Jesus in Philippians 1, it says that Jesus stepped out of eternity, out of perfection, into our world. And he humbled himself, taking on the nature of a servant. And what does a servant do? Servants. Submit. So the whole idea behind marriage is to become a servant, to submit to the other person in the wedding. A servant looks at someone and says, I'm going to put your needs ahead of my own. This is what a healthy Christian marriage looks like. Two people coming together, putting the other's needs ahead of their own. It's like it's like a holy ping pong match. You're trying to outdo one another in submitting to each other. Okay, I see the glazed over look. So let me kind of make it more practical. Um, uh, I've been married 25 years. Uh, we, we met each other in high school, married my high school sweetheart. We don't have the perfect marriage. Uh, Amber and I are both sinners. We still fall short. But we do have pretty good date nights. And if you don't already have date nights on your calendar, that's your homework assignment this week. Get a babysitter, go on a date night, go love your bride, go love your groom. And, and let me kind of just share with you, here's how to submit to one another on a date night. This is just super practical here. Um, even amidst our flaws, our sins, our struggles, it's a holy ping pong match is what this is. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So... Uh, you have a date night, you set it aside on the calendar, you protect it. You don't schedule softball or kids stuff on that night. You get a babysitter or, or, or you, know, you lock the kids in the closet. I don't know what you do. <laughs> but you get outside the house, outside of your normal routine. So it's just you and your loved one. And, and Amber loves date nights. I love date nights. And this is all about submitting to each other. I know how much Amber enjoys time away from the kids, a date night. And so we, we try to do that. That's her will. Amber will dress up, wear something that's appropriate for public, but maybe a little more form-fitting because that's the way I like it. My will. <laughs> we get in the car. I ask Amber where she wants to go to dinner. Her will. She responds, wherever you want to go. My will. I pick out some place that I know she will like. Her will. We get to the restaurant, we sit down, I pick out an appetizer. My will. You see the ping pong match. We enjoy the meal, enjoy conversation. 
I know my wife would love some dinner. We go out to Outback. They got the, the thunder from down under with that chocolate that's just so good. Like they just microwaved it. So we order dessert, <laughs> her will. And we go home, the kids are asleep, the babysitter is gone. We engage in some adult activities. We pretend to be Pentecostals. There's lots of tongues laying on of hands. <laughs> My will. <laughs> some of you are brand new, and you're, you're starting to whisper to the person next to you, is that the pastor? Yeah, we're praying for him. <laughs> Some of you are kind of like, what did he just say? Well, maybe you've never seen a happy pastor. Okay, so <laughs> this is what the culture of a healthy, Jesus-honoring marriage looks like. Both people trying to put the will of the other person over their own. It's a holy ping-pong match. Here's what's unhealthy. When one or both people are asserting instead of submitting. That's what we see in TV shows, movies, in our friends' relationships. This is why it gets complicated, is when we assert our will instead of submitting to the other person's will. There's three categories. You may want to jot these down. These will help you out next time you get into a fight. Category one, both people are asserting their will, not submitting. When you've got two people asserting their will, there's fireworks, there's going to be clashing, there's going to be lots of arguing. It's a wartime mentality. Both people feel attacked. That's category one. Category two is one person submitting, the other always asserting. This is dysfunctional. It feels like a hostage situation. The person who's always submitting feels exploited, run over, taken advantage of, and it can happen with a, a woman or a man when it comes to asserting your will over and over and over. Women do it through manipulation. Men do it through intimidation. And eventually the person who is submitting all the time, they just give up. They feel run over. They feel like there's no point. They feel taken advantage of. The third category for a healthy relationship, a good marriage, is both people submitting their will to the other person. The holy ping pong match. It's not a war situation. It's not a hostage situation. It's a marriage situation. And both people feel loved. Now, men, I know this is difficult. Maybe you didn't have this model to you in your family of origin. You can be the fork in the road. You can change your family tree. And I know there's days that you come home from work, you're tired, you're stressed out, you're overworked, you just wanna go play golf. You don't feel like submitting your will to her will. Fine, fine, but. Jesus didn't feel like going to the cross, but he still submitted his will for the good of his bride, the church. Aren't you glad that he did? So men, that's your role model. That's who you are aspiring to become more like. Jesus, not the other guys at work. Men, when it comes to marriage, your job is to look at the cross and then shut up. The shape of your life is to look like the shape of Jesus' life who laid down his life. Little boys live by their feelings, but men live by their commitments. You made a commitment to that woman. That's your job. Ephesians 5 continues on in verses 22 through 24. It speaks to the ladies. It says, wives... Don't throw anything at me yet. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the body, of which he is the Savior, the church. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. I told you this is a difficult passage. 
Like, if your Bible was a stick of dynamite, this verse is, is where you would light it to just blow up. Because too many bad preachers, too many awful churches will take this passage and just, like, screw it up out of context. So let me walk us through this carefully, line by line. Let's understand what God is trying to communicate to us through his word. Because people will look at this section and they'll have objections. They'll get riled up. They'll get angry. They'll say, well, of course the Bible says that. It was written by men. Let me answer your objections real quick. Okay, let me just put to rest your objections so that we can deal with the text together and learn together. So uh, uh, here's the first thing you need to know if you object to this passage. There's a logical fallacy called discourse analysis. And let me explain to you what discourse analysis is, because once you understand what discourse analysis is, you're going to see it all over the TV screen, all over the culture. When you totally ignore what's being said by calling into question the motives of the sayer, it's your way to sidestep what's actually being said. So if, instead of dealing with the argument, you just attack the motives of the person saying it. So when you say, of course the Bible says that it was written by men, you're not dealing with the, what the Bible says. You're just trying to dismiss it by questioning the motives of the sayer. Politicians are really good at discourse analysis. Here's the second thing I'd say if you object to this. Guys, we are Christians. This book, it's kind of like our thing, okay? Uh, the Bible was penned by men, but it was inspired by God. There is the word, and then there is the world, and the word and the world are always in conflict with one another. You have to make a decision. Does the word take precedence over the world? Or does my world take precedence over the word? That's the decision you have to make. A third objection people will say about this text is they'll say, Oh, that's so regressive. That's old way of thinking. It's oppressive, it's uninformed, it's uneducated, the Bible is outdated, it's patriarchy. Nobody says or believes that anymore. Okay, I hear you. And I'll concede that point. You're right. The majority of our culture does not say or believe this anymore. You're right, but actually that's a point in my favor because look at the condition of marriages and families in our culture and then ask the question, is it working? Is it working? Is what the world is saying working? Last week I shared with you a ton of the latest statistics on families and marriages. Right now in our culture, we have the lowest marriage rate in American history. We have the highest divorce rate. We have the lowest sexual satisfaction rate. This is the angriest, loneliest, most depressed generation on record. 50% of marriages end in divorce. We have the lowest fertility rate on record. Pornography is rampant. And oh, by the way, 88% of pornography is, uh, contains violence against women. 40% of children are born out of wedlock. We can't even figure out what's the difference between a man and a woman. And it's the highest suicide rate since World War II. So look at the outcomes in our culture and then ask, is it working? Stop listening to the fools. You can listen to the world and have a crappy marriage, or you can listen to the word and have a blessed marriage. Amen. Now, I understand some women are repulsed by this verse because they've seen men who have refused to step into their calling 
and everything burned. They've seen bad men, either by abdication, passivity, or aggression, abuse. They've seen men refuse to step into this Christ-like calling, and therefore, they're scared of any type of leadership from a man. This is what submission does not mean. So let me share with you three things submission is not. And this is in your fill in the blank notes. Three things submission is not. Number one, women submit to men. Not true. That's not what submission is. In that verse, it said, wives, submit to your own husband. Not to all men, to your husband. So young women, listen, you may end up with a boyfriend who tries to assert his leadership over your life. You should submit to me, woman. Nope. In those situations, if you're dating, you say, nope, I'm an independent contractor right now. You have not proven yourself to be worthy of me by your godly character. You should earn my loyalty by your marital commitment. Put a ring on it. I'm out. <laughs> Number two, what submission is not. Submission to sin or abuse. Submission is not permission to submit or to sin or abuse. Think of the military. You respect the rank. Everybody is under authority in the military. There's positional authority. A soldier never has to obey an unlawful command from their superior, even though the officer has authority over the soldier because there's a higher authority over that officer. What this means is a wife never has to submit to her husband's authority if he's abusing his authority or leading her into sin. Why? Because the husband has authority over the family, but Jesus has authority over the husband. And where Jesus and the husband disagree, Jesus pulls rank and wins every time. And the third thing that submission is not is that husbands get their way. That's not submission. Husbands get their way. This is not a manipulation verse to get your way, guys. She is not submitting to you. She is submitting to the presence and authority of Jesus coming in through you. And husbands, how are you called to lead? Like Jesus, who laid down his life for her. What headship means is that the man is using everything he can to make sure that his family, his wife are blessed, cared for, and protected. That's how you use your authority. So, ladies, when you hear a man say, woman, submit, you reply, man, die. (laughs) Submission means making space for him to lead. So, um... When I do premarital counseling, I'll have the couple read a book together. And a book that I really recommend, you can get on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, is a book by um, Tim and Kathy Keller. It's called The Meaning of Marriage. And and you can also YouTube it. They've got whole messages together. Tim and Kathy Keller, uh, a couple from New York State. They started a church, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in the 80s. Uh, Tim Keller died just a few months ago, and so there's a lot of material about his wisdom and his, uh, his preaching online, but that's not who I want to quote. I want to quote his wife, Kathy, in the book, The Meaning of Marriage. Kathy explains submission this way. <clears throat> Kathy Keller writes, submission means that in matters of disagreement, I yield to him the deciding vote. I get a vote. He gets a vote, and then he gets the deciding vote. So men, love your wives as Christ loved the church and laid himself down for her. Men, in your family, you do wear a crown, but it's primarily a crown of thorns. 
So a lot of guys are going, this is weird. I didn't learn this growing up. What do I do? Because I know there's going to be an awkward lunchtime conversation. Okay, guys, let me help you out, okay? Uh, let me give you some clear targets. Write these down, guys. Okay, open up your smartphone real quick. Type these into a note so you can review it later, okay? I'm going to give you some clear targets. Very easy. Entry level. You can do this. You can do this. You lead by example. It's the same with business. As goes the leader, so goes the organization. As goes the man, so goes the family, okay? This is from one grace needy man to other grace needy men. I don't have this down perfect either. This is a challenge in my own life. You need to be able to say to your family, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. Here's an example for you. Look at Joseph in the Bible, in the New Testament. Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus. Joseph, the adoptive father of Jesus. He doesn't say a single word in scripture. Not one word. He's quiet. He's humble. He's hardworking. It says that he was a tecton, which means he either worked with stones or he was a carpenter. So he worked a nine to five backbreaking job, sweat of his brow, uh, minimum wage, but he protected his family, provided for his family, loved his family. He was steady. He was strong. And here's the thing about Joseph. Four times he's given a clear command by God. Four times he obeys God. Make that your role model. Be like Joseph. Set an example for your family. Guys, there's too many families where the wife or the woman drags the guy to church. Don't be that guy. Be the spiritual leader. Okay, this is your job. Put it on the calendar. Make church a priority. Show up. Give. Serve. Cheerlead. Let's go. Let's do this. Men, it's about leading and loving. Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 31, says these words to the guys. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her by making her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word to present her as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Let me pause there. So ladies, uh, I know uh, that when it's the evening or it's first thing in the morning and you're getting changed, kind of you know, drinking your coffee or getting things together, you may pass by the, the body size mirror in the bathroom and, and you may just take a quick look and go, oh, I don't like that. You'll cover up, right? Guys. When we're changing, we walk by the big mirror and we see ourselves, every guy in this room will go. <laughs> Still got it, right? Because men love their bodies. We love our bodies. We just think we are everything. We're the Hulk. We're the Avengers rolled into one. Yeah. So the scriptures say, love your wives as your own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their own body, just as Christ does for the church. Each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself. So clear targets, guys. Here's what you want to do this week, okay? Put on your big boy pants. These are some clear targets. Here's how to love her. This week, number one, love her financially. Provide for your family. We got a verse for this. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, it says these words. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his own family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So guys, provide for her financially. Take that worry, take that stress off of her. God has called you to work hard to provide for your family. Number two, clear target, love her emotionally. Men, let her access your heart. 
I'm not saying you need to hold hands and sing kumbaya and get all weepy. It's not what I'm saying. You need to practice intimacy, which you break down the word intimacy. It's into me you see. Let her see your heart. The, the world will say that men have to be tough or tender. The word shows a tough and tender man. His name is Jesus. Jesus was the lion and the lamb. Jesus was tough enough to go to the cross. He was tender enough to weep when his friend died. So men, be tough for your wife. Be tender with your wife and family. When you never share your heart with her, then she has a husband who is physically present, but emotionally absent. And men, that makes your wife feel horrible. It's hell to be married and lonely. So share with her. Talk about your day. Practice being vulnerable. Number three, love her verbally. Verbally express your love to her. Like, look at your text messages. This is an easy way for guys to love her verbally. Do you text encouraging, uplifting words to your wife? If you don't, start. It only takes a couple seconds. It's easy. Do a verbal audit of your texts. Just like God lavishes his love on us, are you lavishing your love on her the way that Jesus does with the church? Every time you think of something good about her, text her. Let her know. Tell her. If you think it, text it. Don't take her for granted. You can text things like, I love you because you put our family first and you have so many hidden sacrifices I don't know about. Or I love you, especially when I come home and you've done this for me, it makes me feel loved. Or, or I think back to when we first met and I love you just the same way as I saw you across that crowded room. Verbally love your wife. Master the art, listen, Master the art of non-sexual affection. Because listen, guys are good at taking any conversation and making it sexual, all right? Your wife could say, hey, we, we got to uh, rotate the wheels on the Jeep, and you've got to be like, I'll rotate your wheels later. But we'll take anything. We can talk about anything. Guys will make it sexual. Now, now, now women, your man is not a pervert. He's just a guy, okay? <laughs> but men, master the art of non-sexual affection, okay? Master the sentence. Here's the sentence. I love you because. I love you because. Ephesians 5.33 says, Each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. So men and women are equals, but they're not equivalents. Ladies, the key to your husband's heart is respect. You cannot disrespect a man into respectability. So uh, something that happens sometimes is I'll be out in the lobby afterwards, meeting people, fist bump, shaking hands, and, and a, a wife will drag her husband into my presence and say, Pastor John, this is my husband. He hasn't been to church in five years and I had to drag him out of bed to get here today. What you just did is humiliated your husband in front of another man. You're not going to disrespect your husband into respectability. Ladies, here's what you do. When your guy tries to put into practice things that he heard today in the sermon, he may even pull out his smartphone and go, love her Verbally, I love you because. When he does that, here's what you do, ladies. Simple, you ready? Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. Way to go, honey. I love you. You listen to the message I'm sharing for you. I've got your back. That's how you respect your husband. You be his biggest cheerleader. When he takes baby steps, you go all out with the pom-poms and everything. Get the confetti out. Cheer that guy on. With your words, you give him a crown, and then he'll become a king. Encouragement in the mouth of a woman 
is strength in the heart of a man. Let me pray for you guys. All right, we're going to bring up the lights. Cue the music. <laughs> we'll bring up the lights. and uh, We have the opportunity to uh, celebrate some baptisms today. And first, I want to introduce you to my friend. If you want to share your name and where you're from to everyone. I'm uh, Tom from Chesney. This is Tom from Chesney. So that's a commute. 45 minutes. 45 minutes to church. Holy cow. Share with us just a little bit of your story. What was life like before God entered the picture? Well, most of my life, I, I've never really loved myself. It took a long time to get there. I made a, a lot of bad mistakes. And most of the time when I thought about the bad mistakes when I was younger, it was only because of the repercussions of what I did and not because I felt bad because of what I did. And uh, I, I never truly loved other people like I should have and many of them have gone passed out of my life and I, I miss them terribly too so so Tom something changed you you met Christ what what was that experience for you how did that happen well I've been in and out of the church most all of my life uh, very lukewarm Christian not good um, many a times I hear this voice in either my conscious or God whispering into my ear, this is what you should be doing instead of what you are doing. Or there was other times that just things come about that I needed to, I needed to change. I just knew I did. And for the longest time, I just, I, I couldn't commit wholly to it. So that's why I've never been baptized before. So, wow. So today you're submitting to Christ You're going public with your faith. Uh, we're all here to celebrate that with you. Thank you. If you want to take a step forward, go ahead and cross your arms. Tom, based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. life like before God entered the picture? Uh, a lot of confusion, uh, a lot of mistakes. A lot of confusion, um, a lot of mistakes. Yeah, a lot of sin, bad choices, impulsive choices, uh, a lot of regret. Uh, it seemed like the more I tried to fix my... <laughs> you now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Lena from Hemlock. And Lena, uh, what was life like before God entered the picture? Um, I've been with like, Christ most of my life, but sometimes I wasn't like fully like, there so sometimes during school and out sports, it just got very hard for me to get to learn. So what changed? What happened? How did Christ become real to you? Um, it was in the summer when we went to, I went to this Christian camp. It was for like a week. And 
and I just got so much connected with uh, Jesus. That's awesome. And what, what difference has God made in your life since then? Um, I've just, like, I've not been so mad when things happen. It's just I know that everything now happens for a reason. That's fantastic. If you'd like to step up here. There you go. And Lena, based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So those are lives that have been changed by God's grace through Life Church. And as we worship with one final song together with the band, you have an opportunity to create more of those stories, to invest in what God is doing here at Life Church through the giving of your tithes, offerings, and donations. Every dollar goes to outreach, to impacting lives. And so there'll be a basket that gets passed around. There's also uh, on the smartphones, lifechurchgive.com. We do ask, though, if you're new today, if you're checking things out, do us a favor. Leave your wallet in your pocket. We're not after your money. We're after your blue connection card. So if you're new today, fill out that blue connection card. And when we're dismissed after this final song, come say hi in the lobby. We've got a free gift for you. Let me pray for you. Lord God, thank you for this time together to sit under your word and now to worship you. May the lyrics of this final song be a blessing to you, God, as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.